we did have an event earlier today at the University of Maine uh, where we undid the imperial presidency. Uh, so that half of this endless title on the book, uh, you can watch that video. It's now at afterdowningstreet.org and democrats.com and davidswanson.org and so on. So, uh, but we can certainly discuss that that half of the, the topic tonight as well if you want to. But but I want to uh, focus as planned on the forming a more perfect union part uh, of of the the book. And uh, it's interesting to come uh, and talk about rights uh, the day after uh, a vote fails to to give some people. Uh, equal rights, and we had a very interesting discussion this afternoon in, in a group that had been set up of uh, philosophy students and philosophy professors, uh, sort of an informal discussion at the university, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, thinking through a uh, question of majority opinion versus rights of individuals that you set above majority opinion. Um, and majority opinion that's informed and educated and uh, aware and majority opinion of a public that's misinformed and lied to and denied access to useful information and so forth. Um, and, and we were talking about issues like uh, the invasion of Iraq, uh, which a majority of Americans would have voted for, um, would have ended within a year, not six and counting, um, and would not have voted for if properly informed of basic facts. Um, whereas an issue like, should we allow everyone to have an equal right to get married? Not necessarily a question of, of ignorance or lack of facts, um, so much as worldview and values. Um, and, and so, you know, in, in, in my opinion, we need to follow the example that was set in a limited way in our original Constitution and Bill of Rights, and that is to set certain human rights above majority opinion. You know, we can't, if the majority wants to, to lynch somebody, we, we can't just do it. Uh, if the majority wants to deny someone free speech, well, now we can't do it because nobody has free speech, so what would you deny that guy? But, but in theory, the idea is, you know, some things should be should be above uh, the decision of of the majority. That being said, obviously the biggest problem in our in our government in Washington now is is the lack of of respect or, or power for majority opinion. Right? I would gladly have majority opinion rule absolutely on everything uh, and consider that a vast improvement over what we have now where our government uh, in Washington is, is very strongly opposed to the majority view on just about every issue. And I agree with the majority view on just about every issue. Um, and, and so on issues of <coughs> war and of peace, on issues of spending priorities and taking money from the military and putting it into human needs, uh, on issues of, of green energy and corporate influence and election funding and uh, the power of parties and the corporate media and uh, education, transportation, energy, you know, majority view in America is, is far more liberal, sophisticated, generous, wise than we think. You know, very often we're a big majority and we think we're a little minority because our television tells us that. Um, and that being said, you know, the, the majority hasn't got marriage for everyone right yet. Um, although if people over 65 hadn't voted in Maine, we would have been okay. Uh, so, uh, so going forward, you know, people are born, people die. Um, and, uh, some other states are ahead, although Maine is itself ahead of many states on many <coughs> issues. Uh, and I live in Virginia, uh, which is clearly decades away, uh, if that, from where Maine is uh, on this issue. Um, there, I talked about an incident uh, at the, in this philosophy discussion uh, that I think is relevant here. Um, and there was
was a, a forum in Washington recently run by the Rand Corporation on a gentleman by the name of Brzezinski who uh, was a security advisor for Jimmy Carter uh, who opened his remarks by saying, well, obviously we can't leave Afghanistan. Now let me turn to some possibly controversial assertions. And, and, and so, I, I asked, and so I asked him, you know, you got about half the country, a little bit more, says they oppose what we're doing in Afghanistan. How could you get more controversial than that? Right? And, and he said, you know, yeah, but they, they get fatigued, they get tired, they don't know any better. We in the know, you know, the experts, we've got it, we know. It's not controversial for us, you know, we have to stay in Afghanistan, uh, you know, to, to bring democracy, of course, to people, um, and because we, we understand democracy so well here. And, <laughs> and a, a, a friend of mine named Mithya Benjamin, who uh, has a group called Code Pink uh, that is probably known to most, if not every one of you, uh, got up and asked a very similar question of Senator Carl Levin. And Senator Levin actually had a better response than, you're all a bunch of idiots, screw you. He, 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 said, he said, if the majority had been allowed to decide on invading Iraq, we would have invaded Iraq, and you would have opposed it. Right? And that was true. It was absolutely true. Now, we wouldn't have stayed there more than a year, uh, and if we'd been properly informed if we had a, a if we had real freedom of press uh, we we never would have uh, supported that uh, and neither the Congress nor George W. Bush could possibly have cared less whether whether we supported it or not we were going into Iraq regardless um, but it's uh, it, it, it raises some some questions worth thinking about um, our Argentina which spent many years uh, undoing some imperial abuses through accountability for crimes, uh, recently decided they were going to bust up their major media outlets. They weren't going to have monopoly, they weren't going to have a cartel system controlling their communication system. Uh, there's almost nothing that would do more good for this country. Right? We're starting to have a conversation about busting up banks, but we can't even have the conversation because we haven't busted up the media. I mean, it's, it's, it's a cartel. It's, it's interlocking board members, uh, interlocking with other corporate interests. Weapons companies like General Electric uh, are our media outlets. Um, it's, it's outrageously bad. I, I mean, uh, Italy, which I was praising earlier today for still considering kidnapping a crime and enforcing our laws for us, you know, they, they just convicted 22 CIA agents and a, and a U.S. Air Force uh, member uh, of kidnapping, they've they've got it worse. You know, their president controls the state media and owns the private media. Um, but we're we're pretty bad, and we're and we're in some ways worse than them because we don't know how bad we've got it. Um, so we need long and short term media reforms, right? We need to bust up the monopolies. We need free media for elections. We need. We need public media, nonprofit, community media. Uh, we need access to every medium for everyone. Uh, that means satellite and cable and internet and radio. Um, good bill that's making its way through Congress now that's going to open up lots of small radio stations across the country. Um, the last time I was in Maine, I, I think it was the last time I was in Maine, we were in Portland. Bruce was there. Uh, some of you may have been there. And we were in a big church and we had a big forum and a, a lot of good faking and and discussing and shouting and uh and the the newspaper was a block away across the street uh and they didn't show up and, and we thought they should have so we went and banged on their doors and windows and and raised hell until they agreed to meet with some activist leaders, uh, and then they began to have those meetings, and they began to do a little bit better uh, in their coverage. Um, and that was it was fun, and it accomplished something, you know. But I, I I'm at the point now of, of of really drastically prioritizing making our own media, making our own videos as we're doing right now, making our own publications, our own radio shows, and supporting good ones. Uh, and you know the newspapers are dying. You know, and they love to bring as many of us down with them as in the process. You know, and uh, I, I, I think uh, you know, 
to today's event earlier, you know, was covered by a local NBC station. That's a first for me on this book tour. Um, and there was a, a newspaper there. Uh, that's a rarity for me on this book tour. I'm, I'm here uh, talking about problems that are that are more severe in most other places than they may be in Maine. But you know, when peace and justice groups buy full-page ads in the New York Times for tens of thousands of dollars, you know, funding an institution without which we wouldn't have the wars, and bragging about it. Uh, instead of putting that money into good media outlets that do good, honest reporting, uh, and, and enlarging them so that they reach more people, as the New York Times is handling very well all on its own, the process of reaching fewer people. Uh, I, I think, <laughs> I, I think it, in, in not the very long term, it's, it's much more advantageous and, and productive. Um, online media and radio stations uh, that do good media are growing. Um, the, uh, the, the process we went through of trying to impeach Bush and Cheney uh, had absolutely no support from the, from the corporate media. Um, and this was in contrast to saturation coverage of the need to impeach Bill Clinton. And yet in April of this year, uh, we saw uh, some of these torture memos come out, forced out by court decisions. Uh, and we saw the New York Times and lots of major corporate newspapers and media outlets and human rights groups that would never touch impeaching Bush and Cheney. Uh, immediately demand the impeachment of a judge named Jay Bybee. Um, and, you know, nothing happens. Nothing happens. And so Congress doesn't do it, the media loses interest. Um, anything, that's, anything that's not pushed by the leadership of one of the two parties in Washington is not news. Even if it's already news in the media, they shape up and learn better and drop it. Uh, and it goes away um, unless we force it uh, into the media or into Congress and then into the media. Um, we, we have, uh, I, I think, as a number one corrupting force in Washington, the, the restrictions in discussion in, in the corporate media. So that when I go and talk to Congress members or their staffers about, you know, 80% of your constituents want this, why won't you do it? The number one excuse is the media wouldn't like it. When, uh, when we worked closely with John Conyers in them, and when he was in the minority and he wanted more Democrats elected and he was going to end the wars and impeach the criminals and so forth, uh, and, and then he didn't and he wouldn't and we were getting arrested in his office protesting, he told us Fox News would not like it if I impeached Bush or Cheney. And, and it was the, the number one most recurring theme, uh, which is which is completely typical. Um, and that's what we hear now. That's what we hear now about why they won't impeach Jay Bybee. He's not a Democrat. There's no sex involved. He's a right winger, uh, and Fox News wouldn't like it. Never mind if he legalized torture or aggressive war or anything else. Um, and I, I I would put also high on the list of corrupting forces money. Good old dollars. Um, the Supreme Court may very soon rule that there are no restrictions on corporate money in bribery of political candidates, uh, otherwise known as the, the sacred human right of corporate human beings to speak freely by spending money. Right? This is a free speech issue and, a, and, a, and an issue of corporations as, as human beings, as people with rights. Um, and there's a coalition forming, at least one coalition forming, that are going to push back hard against this. It may be something that really wakes people up and gets them involved and energized. Uh, I, I certainly hope so. Um, and, and I would put very high on the list of corrupting forces we have to deal with parties, political parties. Uh, and a lot of how they corrupt is through money. The big donors to the candidates are their parties. Uh, when, a, when a Congress member wants to vote one way and their party leader wants them to vote the other way, you're, you're talking about whether their next campaign is funded or not. right? When Back in June, 
we had a vote on a war supplemental spending bill, one of these things we weren't going to have any more of. Uh, and you only had 51 Democrats even make a pretense, right? When this was a throwaway vote, this is a bill that's guaranteed to pass. You want to vote no to please your constituents, just vote no. Nobody's going nobody's to say a word. You're fine. You're, you're golden. You only have 51. Vote no. Then it goes to the Senate. The Senate adds in the IMF bailout for Eastern European bankers and comes back to the House. Now all the Republicans are going to vote no, every single one of them. And you only need 39 out of the 51 to stick with their no vote, and it dies. Right? And these are the same Republicans who for five years had said it would be treasonous and leave troops in the field with no bullets if you ever voted no on a, on a war spending bill. Right? They all vote no. And, and, and it's up to the Democrats to just, you know, just 39 of them stick with their no vote. Uh, and the thing dies. And for over a week, you had the president, the vice president, generals, cabinet secretaries, congressional leaders doing little else but threatening and bribing these members. They were told, you will be dead to us. You will be dead to us. You will not hear from us. You won't get any money from us. Your bills won't get votes. You won't get chairmanships. You won't get earmarks. You won't get weapons factories. You know, you're gone. Uh, we're back in a, a challenger flood. If you're with us, we'll buy radio ads for you. We'll send we'll send White House big shots and cabinet secretaries to your district to do precedence with you to get you on the front page of the papers with no particular news to announce. Uh, and they're they're still fulfilling some of these promises, you know. Well, we didn't get 51 to keep with it, and we didn't build up from there, even though it was a worse vote, a worse bill. Uh, we, we didn't get 39, but we got 32. And we would have only had 30 if not for the two Congress members from Maine, who were both in that group of 32, who voted no when it actually mattered, when it actually could have made a difference. They still voted no. The question, of course, now is, will they do anything more than vote the right way? Um, yeah, it may seem greedy to, to ask for more of you know the handful of people who have got it right, but if, if, if these two Congress members would make a public commitment that they're going to vote no on any more bills that fund these wars, no matter what wonderful things are stuck in there to make them the bills you can't vote against, you know, relief for hurricane victims and hate crimes legislation and free kittens for children. If, if, if you're going to just vote no regardless, because they can always pass that crap in a separate bill and they know it, right? If you're going to vote no regardless, then why not make a public commitment to your constituents? I'm going to vote no on any bill they bring up in the future to, to fund these wars. Um, if we, had, if we had a growing list of members with that commitment, we would be getting somewhere. And we could get it over 39. We may not get an opportunity where we only need 39. Uh, we may have to build towards 218. But there's no, and that seems very challenging, but there's no easier way we're going to end these wars. We pass a bill. There's a couple of bills. You know, one bill that says we want an exit plan, any exit plan. It can be an exit plan where we where we relocate to Mars in 35 years. It's just some exit plan, right? Uh, but if you pass that, you have to pass it through the Senate and get the president to sign it. It's sheer insanity. Uh, there's another bill that says we won't. No, you can't spend a dollar to escalate in Afghanistan, right? Now, th these are bills that build lists of target members to get on a real list that has teeth. But you pass that, you have to pass it through the Senate and get the president to sign it or override a veto. It's, it's, it's much, much more difficult than getting no votes, right? Just like on any issue like health care, you have a, a, a worse than nothing health care bill. Stop thinking about the president and the Senate and get some House members. 57 promised to vote no on a health care bill this bad. Get 39, 40 of them to stick with that, and it dies, and you do better in round two. So think about how we can get people to make public commitments to vote no on things that you need voted no on and stand by them. Um, the, uh, the other corrupting force that I talked about this afternoon that's not on everybody's list of well-known corrupting forces 
is the fact that we've shifted all the power to the White House. Um, and, and we can talk about that. Um, and, and, and then, you, you know, before sort of laying out what laws to pass and what laws to repeal and how to amend the Constitution, there's, there's this, this problem of the fact that we don't enforce the laws in the Constitution. <laughs> Uh, and so we, we talked about that this afternoon as well. But unless we're going to actually enforce laws, it doesn't matter how perfect we get them uh, in, in, in the code or in the Constitution. Um, but that being said, we have to work on all of these reforms and we have to work on a longer term vision of what we want, of the laws we want, the rights we want to have. Uh, and there are some basic reforms that I think we need just in how the Congress operates. Uh, I think there is absolutely no excuse for the filibuster. I don't mean for using it. I mean for the filibuster rule existing. Who know? Who knows where in the Constitution the filibuster comes in? Not there. It's not there, right? Which which <coughs> book? Which book of the Bible has got the filibuster in it? Right? It's just a rule. It's just a rule. They change rules all the time. They they got through much of U.S. history without that one. They've changed it several times since it was created. Get rid of it. Get rid of needing 60. Get it down to 50 plus 1. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's a rule that lets senators who represent 12%, 11% of Americans block all legislation. There's no excuse for that. Uh, but in the longer term, there's no excuse for the United States Senate. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it almost always is worse than the House. It misrepresents small states' populations as well as large states. Uh, it, it is far more corrupted. Uh, it traditionally pushes legislation that deprives states of power. It's the, it's the Senate health care bills that are, that are being pushed that would... That would put further impediments in the way of states creating health care systems on their own, uh, not the House bills. Uh, and you know, if you were to get rid of it and have one branch of government, uh, and I'm sorry, one chamber in your first branch of government, then you could deal with the fact that it's been so long since the House of Representatives was enlarged and that we're expecting people even if they weren't corrupted by all these forces, to represent 700,000 citizens, which you know is just not a realistic expectation. Um, we need to enlarge the House of Representatives. Uh, and we could do that if we had those nice, beautiful, luxurious suites across the hill in the Senate office building. <laughs> right? um, looking at the rights that we were supposed to have, that we don't necessarily have anymore. Habeas corpus been developed over eight centuries. Is the only right given us in the Constitution before you get to the Bill of Rights. Uh, although, according to Alberto Gonzalez, the Constitution doesn't say you have it. It says it can't be taken away from you. Therefore, you don't have it. Uh, and so we were deluded up until now about, about having the right to habeas corpus. But uh, we don't have it now. We don't have it now. Uh, we have a president who stood in the National Archives in front of the original United States Constitution and took it away from us. So we're going to have a policy of preventive detention. That is to say, imprisoning people without charge or process or limit. Uh, the, the habeas corpus is a suicide prevention line. I mean, the reason that people have killed themselves in Guantanamo is that we've locked them up for no reason, no explanation, and no hope of ever getting out while we're supposed to be the, the hope mongers. And the power of pardon is something that I think has to be dealt with. Um, presidents were supposed to be able to pardon people of crimes unless they were crimes the president was involved in. right? But this past president commuted the sentence of Scooter Libby for obstruction of justice when it was a justice investigation headed towards Cheney and Bush. Pardoning, effectively pardoning someone of a crime authorized by the president. And the fiercest opponents of Bush pardoning 
Cheney and Libby and the rest of them for crimes he authorized, maintained that he could do it. They just didn't want him to do it. That has to be undone. And now we have something worse in this power of granting immunity of nameless people, unspecified crimes, crimes we aren't permitted to see the details of, but and, and we aren't per permitted to know who the criminals are, but we're going to give them all immunity retroactively. Um, you, get, you get into the Bill of Rights, and separation of church and state is, is incredibly damaged. We have endless agencies of our government pushing religion, uh, including our military. Um, freedom of the press, uh, you know, is for people who own a press. It's not, it's not freedom of the press. Uh, freedom of speech and assembly is, is incredibly restricted now. Um, I was uh, arrested in front of the White House a little while, a few weeks ago, for, for being there with more than 25 people. You, you don't have freedoms if you are in more than 25 people. Um, we have common incidents now, including at national conventions of our two parties, where members of the media are preventively detained to prevent them from uh, reporting. Um, the, 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 the freedom to, to organize in the workplace, of course, we do not uh, have. Um, the Second Amendment, you know, which in some, the views of some historians was largely put in to appease the slave states and defend their right to, to enforce slavery with militias, uh, you know, is now used in conflict with, with the right to life. The Third Amendment is in very, very good shape. Anybody know what the Third Amendment is? <laughs> Quartering soldiers. Exactly, exactly. We are, we are not being forced to quarter soldiers in our homes. <laughs> but we have built them homes, permanent homes. We have a standing military with bases all over this country and most of the rest of the world. So we don't actually need to quarter them in our homes. Uh, the Fourth Amendment uh, is in tatters. Uh, the Fourth Amendment says you cannot be spied on without a warrant. You've all been spied on without a warrant. Uh, it, it is no doubt against the state laws in Maine to spy on people without a warrant. If there were a prosecutor at the state or local level in Maine with some decency and some nerve and some ambition, uh, you could pursue this, just as you could pursue the murder of troops sent to unnecessary wars or, the, or, or torture that, that, that you could find any uh, jurisdiction for, uh, which is, is assault and battery. Uh, the Fifth, Sixth, and Seventh Amendments are gone with habeas corpus. Uh, they're already gone in the military for soldiers. Um, the Eighth Amendment, uh, which by most uh, people's interpretation uh, would, would ban torture, uh, you know, clearly is not banning torture. Uh, neither is the Convention Against Torture or the Anti-Torture Statute or any of the other uh, bans on torture. Um, the Thirteenth Amendment ban on slavery, uh, we effectively have slavery on, on farms in this country, on, on islands where we have goods made, including places like the Marianas that are called part of the United States, let's say made in USA. Uh, we, we, and, and you know, slavery shouldn't be permitted as punishment for a crime either, as our, as our Constitution <coughs> allows. Um, the 14th Amendment banning discrimination by race in voting uh, is in tatters. We, we have people removed from voting rolls uh, based on race. We have suppression uh, tactics used in neighborhoods based on race. We have profiling of, of would-be voters based on race. Um, the 24th Amendment ban on a poll tax. You know, we, we don't have poll taxes, but we don't have the day off work to vote. Uh, we don't have automatic registration like we have for the right to go kill and die. Uh, we, we, make it, we make it difficult for people to vote and we make them stand in line for hours and hours to vote when they have to work. Um, fundamentally, I think what we don't have and we should explicitly have in our highest law is, is the right to have all laws applied equally to everyone. 
uh, regardless of any discrimination or, or high nobility <coughs> and officialhood, and the right to have our laws be knowable. Right? There's, there's no reason why a health care bill has to be 2,000 pages. Uh, just giving us, you know, it's, it's not even treated as a requirement, but they've started this idea of voluntarily, generously giving us 72 hours to read the 2,000 pages. It's not, you know, that doesn't cut it, right? These are not even 2,000 pages in English. These are 2,000 pages in Blue Cross Blue Shieldies. You know, this is, <laughs> this is, there's absolutely no justification for it. It's intentional obfuscation. Uh, we don't have the right to vote. We don't have the individual national right to vote. If we did, we could be registered to vote automatically, like we're registered to kill and die, like we get a social security number. It's not a hard thing to do. Uh, we could have a national system of election verification, where you vote on a piece of paper, where it's counted publicly before a variety of interested witnesses in the polling place, and the results are posted publicly in the polling place, and those totals are totaled regionally and state and nationally, and there's no question that you elected the person you elected. Uh, we don't have the right to unionize, and we have a labor movement that was born through aggressive, strategic, militant, nonviolent action that now has done everything they imagined you had to do to get the right to, to unionize. They've elected Democrats. <laughs> and, and what are they doing? Are they sitting in senators' offices? No, they're, they're holding meetings like this one and passing out pieces of paper saying, will you write a handwritten letter saying, dear Senator so-and-so, if it's not too much trouble or any inconvenience, could you please stop screwing us? <laughs> and putting it in the mail. That's what they're doing. And you tell them, look, you elected Democrats, and it didn't work. And they say, no, 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 but we elected Democrats. So we, we need the right to unionize, but the labor movement is not inspiring the rest of us to come to their side to fight for it. We may have to start that fight for them. Uh, we need expanded Magna Carta rights, uh, habeas corpus rights. We... There's no reason not to have on videotape all interrogations and confessions and have those videotapes available to to everyone charged with a crime. There's no reason to have those accused of crimes locked up together with those convicted of crimes and, and so on. I, I go through a lot of, of rights that we should have uh, in, in the book. Um, but I think we, we also should have more positive rights. I mean, the Constitution as it is mostly says the government shouldn't do nasty things. It doesn't say you should have the right to health care. It doesn't say you should have the right to housing. You should have the right to a good education. Right? We should have universal, free, if you want it, preschool, college, graduate school. It's not a big expense if you stopped the wars and the military uh, and, and the unnecessary spending or even just a little bit of the Wall Street bailouts. Um, we should have the right, and and we should have the right to a basic income. I mean, there is no excuse in a place this wealthy to have anyone not have a basic income so that if they just want to get by, they have a chance to go educate themselves, to, to do a, a job they want to have to do, to, to be able to survive hardships and, and illnesses. You should have a basic income. Uh, income, either through a simple basic income guarantee or through something like a maximum wage where, you know, 10, 20 times the minimum wage and you want to raise it, fine, just raise the minimum wage. Uh, I, I, think, I, I think there's no excuse not to have these sorts of positive rights. Um, and and health care is something uh, that states are going to solve for us, not Washington. Um, and the Tenth Amendment says any powers we've not explicitly taken from the states, the states have. The states have the right to give their residents health care. And there are federal laws standing in the way of that, at least making it, making it difficult and less likely. Um, I was just with some people in Pennsylvania who think they've got a bill in their legislature that gets around every existing federal hurdle. But that doesn't mean they won't be sued 
uh, if they pass it and they know it. Uh, and that doesn't mean there won't be further federal hurdles put in place. Uh, but states are going to do it, and states are going to have to have a, a constitutional fight over it. Um, we should have rights in the military, right? There are militaries in this world where you have the right to unionize, where you don't have a separate court system. If you're charged with a crime, you're charged in the same court system as everybody else, and where you don't have to go to a war you don't approve of, right? Why not have a democratic military within uh, within our military? Um, so if we, want, if we want a lot of rights that we don't have now, one way to do it uh, that would have a lot of other advantages would be to cease being one of the few holdouts on a lot of international treaties that give a lot of other countries rights that we don't have. Uh, I think it would be very uh, advantageous. Our, our constitution uh, is not cutting edge anymore. It's, it's very, very old. It's very, very old. It was cutting edge. It's maybe the most influential document of its type, uh, but it's old now, um, and we've barely touched it. You know, we proposed 12 amendments immediately, got 10, eventually got an 11th, uh, and then another 16 amendments. And two of those are to get rid of alcohol and bring it back. And <laughs> so you're, you're talking about 14 amendments, you know, in over two centuries. We've barely tweaked the thing. Um, and you can amend the Constitution through Congress. Uh, it's difficult, but it can be done, and it can be done with a single specific amendment. Um, you know, we may, we may have to force such a thing to take away corporations' sacred right to bribe our elected officials. Uh, but you can also have a convention where you thoroughly revise the Constitution, and you wouldn't want to do it without having gained some power and some reforms along the way first. Otherwise, you know, we're going to have Lockheed Martin and Blue Cross Blue Shield writing our constitution. You know, Article One: You must buy health insurance. You know, it's, it's this is not. It's a very risky thing. People are terrified of the idea of opening up the constitution because you know, imperfect as it is, anything could be made worse. Um, but we're going to have to make it better. We have to make it better, and so we're going to have to get to the point where we can open up uh, revising it. Uh, and we're going to have to get some reforms, much more participation from the public in our so-called democracy, uh, and at least in that convention itself, uh, you know, which could be done through through citizen groups and fourth branches of government and more populist ideas than we're putting our constitution could be used to create the convention to to revise it. Um, there's uh, going to be an effort in Washington, D.C. in March that I just want to mention before having questions and discussion mm -hmm. to do what we should have done several years ago, and, and some of us have been trying consistently since then, and that is to <laughs> shut that city down, not on a Saturday and not for one day, but to shut down the operations of the military industrial complex and of a government that's not enforcing our laws and not passing our laws. Uh, and if you can and if you can watch for the announcements and if you can put the middle of March on your calendar uh, and be in Washington DC for as long as you can, uh, it would be very much to all of our advantage. Um, and and I, I don't know if I want to bring this up or not. Um, <laughs> today, today it was today was the first. You know, I've been giving these speeches for like five years, uh, and up until this year, I never got this sort of question about what's the point? Why do we bother? Why don't we all kill ourselves? And, uh, <laughs> and, and today was the first event I've had this year where I didn't get that question, and. But you told us I, not to. Right. I, <laughs> but I told everybody not to. I told anyway. everybody not to, to do anyway. So you I'm gonna take in. a I'm gonna take a big risk here. And I'm not going to again preemptively answer that question, and I'm not gonna tell you about your moral responsibility not to <laughs> cough the germs of defeatism all over your neighbors by asking it. And I'm just gonna hope for uh, the best and uh, 
and and uh, open this up uh, for discussion. And and I ju I'll just suggest to you that uh, that yesterday in Amherst, Massachusetts, they passed a resolution welcoming and inviting freed victims of Guantanamo to move to Amherst. And they shouldn't be the only town that does that. They shouldn't be the only town that does it. And I, and I want to say that we are privileged uh, to have with us here a candidate for governor of this state uh, named Lynn Williams. Uh, and, and if she wanted to open up the discussion or say anything at all, I think that that would be uh, very useful.